you don't think it's a constitutional crisis well, yet? I'm not quite sure what the phrase means. President Trump is coming. That was a quick eye roll. Yeah, that does not impress me. I followed all the rules leading up to competing. Like, that should be enough. Exactly a year after the U.S. withdrew from the Iran deal, Iran is suspending two of the deal's commitments. It stopped selling off its low-enriched uranium and heavy water, which power nuclear reactors. President Hassan Rouhani gave the other signatories 60 days to protect its oil and banking interests from U.S. sanctions. If they can't, it'll break the deal and once again enrich high-level uranium. Denver voters narrowly passed a measure to effectively decriminalize magic mushrooms. The measure won't change state or federal law, but it will bar the use of city funds to enforce criminal penalties for using or possessing mushrooms containing psilocybin. For the first time since the world's first coal-powered plant fired up in London in 1882, Britain went a week without using coal to generate energy. It's a good sign for the country's chances of reaching a recommended goal of net zero emissions by 2050, but 45% of the power it did use came from gas, which still emits carbon dioxide. After the New York Times got hold of tax documents that show President Trump lost more than a billion dollars between 1985 and 1994, his fan club argued that's actually a good thing. Donald Trump has the best accountants in the world. They're going to organize his finances in a way to minimize his income. And guess what? Not all of us win on everything we buy. Donald Trump still is a billionaire has a 757, a lot of big buildings. If anything, you read this and you're like, wow, it's pretty impressive all the things that he's done in his life. I'm pausing for a moment because I do think this is a moment in history. Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee today continued their quest to get the full, unredacted Mueller report, voting to hold Attorney General Bill Barr in contempt of Congress for not letting committee members get a look at it. Those in favor respond by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. And the ayes have it. And just as the hearing started, President Trump declared that he's invoking executive privilege on all of the Mueller report, including the underlying evidence. So just another day in Washington in the Trump era. But some Democrats are hyping this as something bigger. We've talked for a long time about approaching a constitutional crisis. We are now in it. It makes for a good catchphrase, but Democrats may have trouble making it stick. For starters, they don't seem especially sure where the constitutional crisis line is. Well, it's clearly a political crisis. Um, the so you don't think it's a constitutional crisis well, yet? Well, I'm not quite sure what the phrase means. Um, the Constitution itself is not in crisis. Plus, there's some pesky recent history. Back in 2012, President Obama claimed executive privilege over documents the Republican-controlled House wanted. His AG, Eric Holder, refused to turn them over and got held in contempt. But the two sides just kept fighting it out until it ended up in court. More importantly, even if it is a constitutional crisis, Democrats don't seem to know what to do about it. After this morning's hearing, I think we're going to, to have to take a hard look at, at what additional steps can be taken so that Congress can do its job and the administration cannot keep stonewalling the American people. There is one obvious way to respond to a constitutional crisis. Do you think that impeachment is that next step then? Well, I don't know what, I don't know what the next step is. What we have to do is, uh, as we've laid out, we need to be able to, to uh, for Congress to be able to conduct, for this committee to be able to conduct the hearings necessary uh, to provide oversight of the administration to ensure, as the Mueller report reminds us, that no one, including the president, is above the law. Speaker Nancy Pelosi thinks the president is, quote, goading Democrats into trying to impeach so he can keep casting himself as under siege. And at today's hearing, Republicans appeared eager to help. If you think this administration, this president, is so dangerous, where's... Why aren't you acting on the many resolutions for impeachment you've already introduced? And Congressman Biggs's question kind of gets to the heart of the matter. If Democrats think this truly is a crisis, 
And if they care about principle rather than just politics, at some point, won't they just have to pull the impeachment lever? Speaker Pelosi has made clear that with respect to impeachment, uh, the case must be compelling, the evidence must be overwhelming, and the sentiment must be bipartisan in nature. So before we move to impeachment, we have to collect all of the facts. President Trump is down in the Florida panhandle today for a campaign rally in Bay County, where Hurricane Michael flattened thousands of homes last October, and where the cleanup and rebuilding efforts are still ongoing. The panhandle is Trump country, but this is the first time the president has been to the area since he visited right after the storm hit. And while he will be touring Tyndall Air Force Base, which was hit hard, he's not scheduled to visit any of the surrounding communities all of which have people wondering if the guy they helped put in the White House has since forgotten about them. Oh, they start immediately. Yeah, they start immediately. Shelly Summers and her husband started housing displaced families shortly after Hurricane Michael, which hit Bay County seven months ago. Then they just kept on doing it. How was this built out? I mean, it started with one tent. Yep, it started with one tent right there. Over time, with just wherever I could clear a spot from the trees and the debris is where I would put a tent, because I was clearing them by hand. Do you have any sense of how many tents there are at this point? Probably over 20. Shelly spent tens of thousands of dollars of her own money on the makeshift camp, and even built the infrastructure to support it. There are porta potties, an outdoor-ish shower, do you make this? It's like a little yurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a shower. Hundreds of feet of electrical cables. And the tents. These were bought by one of our amazing individual donors. These are hard shell tents. Oh, man. It's got to be like 20 degrees hotter inside. Mm-hmm. About 110 in there. That's what it was yesterday. How was someone able to sleep inside? At night, thankfully, it's still cool. Um, We're working on air conditioners for all of them now. But there are also rules. No drugs, no alcohol, no drama. Those are the three big things. And I do random drug testing. Really, it's easy. Everybody pitches in and helps with chores. They all love to feed my rabbits. So that's the only bickering that there usually is. The rabbits everywhere. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a hundred, uh, or close to a hundred. I'm working towards a thousand. <laughs> What's the most people that you've hosted at a time? Fifty. Fifty people in your backyard. Yes. You must hear a lot of stories. They're all basically the same. Even though everybody has their own individual story, they all come down to the factor that they were left behind. Hurricane Michael displaced almost 20,000 people in Bay County, or about 10% of its population. Charles Summers is one of the roughly 21,000 people across the entire panhandle who received some kind of assistance from FEMA. The agency's given out more than $140 million in temporary hotel stays, rentals, and repairs. Charles got $3,000, which wasn't enough to find permanent housing. How old are you, Charlie? 63. So at 63, you experienced homelessness for the first time? First time in my life. I've never, never been homeless. Mm. I've never stayed in a tent in my life. So were you, were you trying to find other places to live? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But we couldn't afford it. If this didn't exist, if you couldn't come here to Shelley's place, what would you have done? Honestly, the truth about the situation, well, for her, I don't know exactly, pinpoint exactly what I would have done. 60% of the housing stock in Bay County was destroyed in the storm including several public housing complexes. That'd be a problem anywhere, but here, where 70% of people rent, it's been a disaster. Kathy McClellan, who's been a real estate broker for the past 15 years, barely has any rental properties to work with these days. And the units that are available are so price gouged, almost no one in the area can afford them. What's the rental market like for those people here right now? It's high, you can't afford it. 
I would say rental market prices, I would say at least 30%, um, maybe even 50%. Higher than before the storm. Yes, floor. yes. Kathy's own home will be demolished, and she can't afford to move. So she's staying in a camper in her front yard. This is an area where there are a lot of people who don't have a lot of That's money. That's correct. We are um, economically kind of disadvantaged here. Our town is um, tourism. And so the folks that work in the tourism industry, they wait tables, they clean condos, um, they do beach services, they live, you know, week to week, month to month. You know, we pay a lot of taxes and we need a lot of help and we're not getting it. It, it, it makes me mad because we shouldn't have to beg. Greg Brudnicki, the mayor of Panama City, spent three days in Washington, D.C. last week doing just that. Because at the moment, he still can't afford to pick up everything that's on the ground. Our debris bill for Panama City is going to be north of $150 million. Just the debris. So where does the money come from? The money has to come from the federal government. We're north of 200 days. And when we call on the phone, crickets. Bay County is still waiting on a disaster relief bill that would allocate almost a billion dollars to Florida. It's currently stuck in Congress because Trump and other Republicans are trying to limit the amount of money promised to Puerto Rico. I feel for the Puerto Rican citizens, but we're all waiting because there's partisan politics going on. How do you feel about President Trump coming to this area, coming to Panama City Beach, when the disaster relief aid bill has not been passed? Well, you know, he was here right after the storm. He came, Pence came, Ben Carson came. So we've had a lot of people from Washington come here and, and put eyes on it. Are you worried that you'll just end up going to a rally that doesn't acknowledge the devastation that still exists just over the bridge? Uh, no. I think they're going to, I think they're going to, I think that's going to be a big part of why they're coming here. I mean, it's got to be. While Brunicki uh, continues to give Trump the benefit of the doubt, 30 miles away at Shelley's, everyone's still operating under the assumption that no more federal aid will be coming anytime soon. If Trump comes here and he doesn't visit this area, if he just goes to Panama City Beach. I won't be surprised. That's what you expect. We're not important enough. We're not publicly known. We're not stars, we're not government, you know, we're just people. The 40,000 people packed into this soccer stadium aren't here for a match. They're here for a rally for an upstart political party, the EFF. The EFF are challenging the African National Congress, the party Nelson Mandela belonged to, and that has controlled South Africa since the end of apartheid. This was the last rally before the election. Today, they went to the polls. Why'd you come out here today? To show the people of South Africa that we have an understanding of what the ANC promised to us and then they failed. Now we have a person who's responsible so and be accountable on whatever the promises that they made. The EFF seems to be really popular among young people. Yes. Why do you think that is? I think that young people want change. I think that young people want to own this world. Young people want to run this country. Because old people have failed us. And old people is the ANC. It's ANC. We need young blood. We need young people, hyper people. Yes, to go this thing. For a party that barely existed last election cycle, the turnout is pretty impressive. Mandela has handed over the paycheck to a younger generation. And that younger generation is in the EFF. Julius Malema is the founder of the EFF. 
Malema is a divisive figure, to put it lightly. He's been convicted of hate speech, twice. Once for chanting songs encouraging killing white farmers, and once for saying that the victim of a rape enjoyed it. But his supporters don't seem to mind. They're frustrated with the ANC, and they see him as a way forward. Political apartheid is over. We still have economic apartheid. Apartheid ended 25 years ago. But white South Africans, who make up less than 10% of the population, still hold more than 70% of all agricultural land in the country. The EFF say they can fix that. Their signature policy is taking ownership of land away from white farmers without paying them, then redistributing that land to black farmers. Why are the farm owners white people only? You have been watching them eating. Now you are going to eat. The ANC does have a land reform program of its own, but progress has been painfully slow. We have mangoes, we've got uh, bananas, uh, we've got a little bit of livestock, we've got some cash crops. Yeah. Opashai is a tenant farmer working land that was redistributed by the ANC, so he should be a success story. Uh, I've been here ever since from 2013 with this farm. I'm the only one here who is responsible for this place. But uh, it's quite difficult for us now. When the Department of Rural Development gives farmers land, it's supposed to come with funding for necessities like feed, fertilizer, and tools. Shai still hasn't gotten that funding. What is this here? This is the, the tomato. This is the crop farming land. Mm. But as we can see here, we're trying now to irrigate them. They need attention, these things. They need some fertilizers. Mm. And we are running short of cash for the fertilizers to put on them. And this is something the government promised you. This is what they promised me. They will help us. But even now, now it's seven years. And it's too long. I've been patient enough. It's difficult. It's, it's hectic. It seems like, yeah. particularly in the past, yeah. if a white farmer needed a loan, yeah. they didn't have problems getting them. I cannot get it now because it belongs to the government. It doesn't belong to me. So I'm just a caretaker here. I'm leasing this farm, actually, to government. So I have to pay. Jessie Duarte has been in the ANC ranks on and off since the early 1990s. She says that implementing land reform properly takes time. So I spoke with a farmer in Limpopo who was able to get land. But the problem that he's having is that he was also promised funding for materials, for, for training. And he's been waiting for years and he hasn't gotten that. If he's genuine, and if uh, the farmer is in question, says he's been waiting for years, then his next step ought to be, and he would have known this, to make an application to the uh, local agricultural MEC. It sounds like he's been doing this. I am not sure. I can't answer a question I don't know, and I would really like to be able to know this farmer and ask him to tell us why he's been waiting for so long so that we can assist him. This is the party of Mandela. Is your party concerned at all that for the younger generation, they may not support the ANC from that emotional level, they may go somewhere else? We live in a democracy. We created a multi-party democratic system as the ANC. If we wanted a one-party system, we would have done so. We didn't want that. Oh, uh, th th is, is there anything I, else? I'm done. Want? Thank oh, you very well, so, much. Uh, so I have, I have one last thing. I've spoken to many people who do support EFF. Their support seems to come from protest, dissatisfaction with the ANC. All I can do is to hope you and the EFF success um, in, the, in the coming election. That's all we can hope to do is to hope you the and the EFF success. I'm not running Many, in this election. You, you, you're running a campaign for them here, that's for sure. But let me, hope, let me wish you success. We certainly don't feel that we have lost the vote in this country. Realistically, 
Even if the ANC does lose some votes, they're still expected to win by a pretty wide margin. But many of the people they promised to help aren't convinced by either party. In the past, you said yeah. you were very optimistic about the ANC. It sounds like the ANC has lost your trust. Yes. With the agriculture right now, they, they disappointed me now. What do you think about the EFF? No, I'm not an EFF member myself. I don't support that, and I don't like what he's doing there. Who are you going to be voting for in the elections? <laughs> That's quite a combination, I think. of all shapes and sizes showed up to lift heavy. Each performed the three required lifts. The bench press, the squat, and the deadlift. 225 pounds, y'all. But one powerlifter was forced to sit on the sidelines. Her name is JC, and she's trans. competed in sports her whole life, and at a young age, even had Olympic ambitions in curling. So these are my um, two medals from U.S. Powerlifting Association's Minnesota State Championship. USA Powerlifting is a member of the International Powerlifting Federation, which itself observes Olympic rules that have allowed trans athletes to compete since 2004. But after JC applied to compete in a meet, USAPL defied those rules. In January, the Federation banned transmasculine athletes who take testosterone, as well as all transfeminine athletes, even if those athletes lower their testosterone levels, like JC does. So this is, your, this is the email that you got from USA Powerlifting. Yep. Yeah, and it says, that request has been denied. Male to female transgenders are not allowed to compete as females in our static strength sport as it is a direct competitive advantage. What was your reaction? Disappointment and also like not being surprised entirely because of the way that trans women and trans feminine people are treated in, in sports. Do you think it's fair for you to compete in the women's category? Absolutely. Why? Why not? I followed all the rules leading up to competing. And like my own beliefs aside, like that should be enough. This is, this is what happens, right? When trans people meet all the rules, they'll just establish more rules to govern our bodies and like our participation in society and in sport. The military, schools, bathrooms, Conversations surrounding the inclusion of people who are transgender aren't new. But for sports, the debate isn't social. It's about biology. And the question is whether a disadvantaged group, in this case, has an edge. Katrina Carcasis is a bioethicist who works on testosterone and sex testing regulations in sports. Do trans women have an advantage over cis women in, in sports of strength like powerlifting? People want to make these broad generalizations. Trans women have an advantage, but it's always going to be much more complicated than that. For somebody who's transitioned, part of what is happening is that you might lose some muscle mass by lowering your testosterone level. Somebody is now using less muscle mass to push around the same size body, right? And once you start lowering your testosterone, those drugs also have side effects that can include fatigue, right? That can include metabolic issues. Testosterone. Mm -hmm. Does it influence sports performance? It does. So it is related to things like lean body mass, but it's not necessary or sufficient to push an athlete to be at the top level. So you can't assume that the people with the highest levels of testosterone do better. What Katrina is saying is that there's no clear link between testosterone and sports performance. 
it's a spectrum. And for trans athletes, there's a cost to lowering your testosterone. But what about JC? How good is she? We asked her coach. Okay, don't get mad. <laughs> okay. It's totally okay. Okay. So JC is a great athlete, and she's a strong, skilled lifter. In her weight class, she's not yet a standout lifter. <laughs> it's okay. It's totally okay. Yeah. All right. My successes have definitely been, like, grossly blown out of proportion. And we will have Christina coming up next, squatting 92.5 kilograms, 203 pounds. Since USA Powerlifting's announcement, a small number of lifters have participated in timeouts to protest the new policy. So you've signed up for this meet? Yes. But you're not going to lift? I will not be lifting. For Brianna Diaz, let's hear it for Brianna. We want to hear you supporting her. Whenever you step into on the, on the platform, you're given about one minute to take your lift. And if you do not take it, it is considered a bad lift. And so what I will be doing is uh, time out my meet by standing there for the for one minute for each of my three attempts. After a few timeouts, a USA powerlifting official disqualified Brianna. At this point, if you haven't taken a squat, right. then I can't let you continue in the right. meet. It's a fair play issue. Beyond that, I can't discuss it. How, how is it fair to ban trans lifters? All I can say is, like I said, it's a fair play issue based on our principles. They've been long standing with regards to drug use. And anything more than that, I can't say. It's not up for me to say. On Friday, USA Powerlifting asked its female members to weigh in on the transgender policy through an online vote that will be discussed at a board meeting on May 9th. The president of USA Powerlifting, Larry Mail, declined an interview. In a written statement, he told Vice News, quote, We will discuss this among our members and come to what we feel is the best decision for our organization. He also added, There's no point in trying to convince a partisan crowd. We deserve a place in sports, too. The bottom line is that even in the fundamental principles of Olympism, they recognize that sport is a human right. Do trans people get human rights? And the answer is yes. 